Now we move on to the next concept of equipment management, equipment in the post-purchase phase. So we talked about equipment purchase and in the earlier video we talked about the pre-purchase planning. Okay, so that itself was a very extensive concept and now we move on to the next concept which is the post-purchase phase. So as soon as an equipment comes in, what do you do? Do you just start working on it? No, there are certain things that you have to do with the equipment before you actually put it for patient reporting. So once the equipment has been purchased and delivered to the laboratory, we need to establish with confidence that the equipment is capable of operating within established limits of and tolerances. This is achieved through installation qualification, operational qualification and performance qualifications. Three points that we have to understand in detail. So what is IQ or installation qualification? IQ ensures that the equipment delivered meets the DQ specifications and it is correctly set up in the customer lab as planned. IQ is a responsibility of the manufacturer. So once again, the equipment has arrived and it needs to be set up correctly. And this process setting it up is called the IQ or the installation qualification. And it is the responsibility of the manufacturer. IQ encompasses detailed instructions for setting up the equipment. These are found in the installation and the operating instructions manual along with interface descriptions, installation diagrams, etc. IQ also verifies that any subsystems or the ancillary systems have been delivered, installed and configured in accordance with the manufacturer's specifications or installation checklist. Never open an equipment package before the installation team arrives. The process including any damage or defect should be documented and signed by both the manufacturer's representative and the laboratory representative. Very important, do not open the curtains before the installation team arrives. Similarly, all spare parts listed in the supply list should be checked, verified, signed and countersigned. And this also a very important thing that you have to inventorize your uh, spare parts and you keep it in a place under one person who will be responsible for the spare parts and which can be retrieved whenever required. The, this entire process of installation with all documents should be filed. These files should be available in the lab for the entire life of the equipment. So we talked about documentation in the first video. How is cross-cutting? How documentation is required in every aspect of your equipment management? Starting with your URS. Okay, to, just to recap, you have three or four equipment that you have checked out. You have filled in your URS forms. You have done the DQ whereby your, one of your equipment has satisfied all your conditions and therefore that becomes your, that is what you are ordering for. So that's your first document that you are keeping. Now that the equipment has come in, you have your IQ as the first document as part of your equipment management thing once the equipment arrives in your lab. There's a sample IQ documentation document which is shown here. Please look at the components of what this particular equipment requires as part of the insulation process. So once the IQ is complete, you go to the next part, which is operational qualification. Operational qualification is also the responsibility of the manufacturer. That is, once the protocol for IQ phase has been met, operational qualifications or OQ is performed to check if the equipment is operating in consistence with the URS or the user requirement specification and also with the manufacturer specified operating ranges or the claims of the manufacturer. To, to say that again, your IQ is over, the equipment is installed, you have made your inventory record and there are certain steps now that we have to go through to verify that the manufacturer's claim and your URS requirements are being met. So these are done through a few processes of calibration, verification of operating procedures and maintenance program development and training. So we'll go through that in this section. So during the OQ phase, all the items in the test plan are tested individually and their performance is documented. 
The operations specified in the menu as far as testing is concerned as are configured, calibrated and verified using quality control material during this process. The quality and technical managers and the manufacturer's technical support team should work together in consensus for the OQ. It's not though it is a responsibility of the vendor, it is also very important that the technical team stay invested in this process. The document OQ also should be signed by the manufacturer and countersigned by the laboratory. Training of all operators is also part of this vital step and should be completely documented. A sample OQ document is shown here. The sample OQ document includes operational qualifications, reference OQ protocol and engineers and customers name with signature and training and skill development also. It also sometimes is called the personal qualification or PQ. So since it's getting confused with the performance qualification, this term generally is not used. But this is also very important that your personnel are qualified for operating the equipment during the OQ. After the OQ and before embarking on the next step of equipment acceptance, it is imperative that the training and skill development be built into the system. All staff who will be concerned with the operation monitoring and maintenance of the equipment should be trained in all aspects of the equipment by the technical support personnel. So this is the very another key component. So after OQ, you have to go to the next part is the training. Part of the OQ, not after OQ, it's part of the OQ that the training. It should be trained. All staff should be trained. Uh, develop a written plan for calibration, performance verification and proper operation of the equipment. Establish a scheduled maintenance program that includes daily, weekly and monthly maintenance tasks. Designate those authorized to use the equipment and when it is to be used. These are all important things that you have to plan before you hand over the equipment to your frontline worker. This, is, this part becomes the responsibility of the technical supervisory team to understand and write a plan for calibration, performance verification and proper operation of the equipment and to make a plan for maintenance. What is your daily maintenance requirements, weekly as needed maintenance requirements? Please ensure that these things are adequately made and developed before you hand over the equipment for routine work. Designate those authorized to use the equipment and when it is to be used. Designated personnel should be trained in all important aspects of the equipment, operation, maintenance and calibration, record keeping, quality control, recognizing flags and alerts shown by the equipment, basic troubleshooting, etc. Their name should be clearly indicated on the equipment. This is another requirement is to have that authorization label on that equipment that what you see in the sample label there that these are the following frontline workers or technicians who are authorized to use this analyzer. And then this should be approved by the director of the lab or whoever is competent to authorize this kind of a equipment handling. So that's another important part of your OQ. So your equipment is now ready. It's been installed. It's been operationalized by do, for configuring the test and calibrating it. And all operations are now ready to go. So your OQ is now done. So is it over? Now, not yet. It's not over till you do a PQ or a performance qualification. PQ is the documented proof that the equipment performance in the customer facility is, as expected, meets the user's requirement. Though the DQ, IQ and OQ have passed, it still is the duty of the user or the laboratory to verify the performance of the equipment on their sites. In this is because as the equipment undergoes shipment, it is expected that some alignments could have changed. Thus, a verification step performed as performance qualifications becomes imperative. And the performance qualification here includes testing new samples and analyzing data, establishing the stability for temperature controlled equipment, and validating the performance of with parallel samples. So, this is a very Precise way of saying doing the performance qualification. However, we would like to direct you to the CLSI guidelines 
on performance verification. So uh, just at this point, I would like to say one thing. This accept this entire process of IQ, OQ, PQ together is termed as acceptance testing or verification by the ISO. And this is all part of your laboratory quality management system, how to put the equipment to use optimally. So now going back to the performance qualification, manufacturers provide performance characteristics for testing methods using their kits or instruments in the package inserts or operator's manual. However, laboratories need to verify the manufacturer's performance claims and demonstrate they can get the same results using the kits or equipment in their laboratory using their frontline workers. So that is the concept of performance qualification. So this is not an, done in one or two days. It generally takes up to 20 days, at least a couple of weeks before you can actually evaluate the entire performance of the machine. And ideally, it's only after this performance qualification that it should be put to use for patient reporting. There are seven performance characteristics that should be evaluated before reporting results of a new test or a method as per CLSI guidelines include precision, which is the degree of dispersion between repeated measurements using the same measuring system, accuracy, which is a measured bias, and comparability, which is a measured differences, linearity over the measuring interval or analytical measurement range, limits of detection and limits of quantification or analytical sensitivity, specificity or interference, reagent or an sample or analyte carryover, biological reference interval, or clinical decision value, which is interpretative in, in information. So these are the many things that need to be checked through before you uh, say that this machine can now be used for patient reporting. Once again, I would like to direct the listener to the uh, videos that we have on quality control and the module on uh, method evaluation and quality control, where we have given more uh, details of this. And uh, there is also a statistical tool our four statistical tools in that for method evaluation, one for accuracy, one for precision or repeatability, and one for linearity and for change of biological reference ranges. So there are many tools which are available in that uh, toolkit. And there is also a user manual which actually describes the entirety of this process of method evaluation. And uh, I would like to direct you to that particular um, tool to understand more about the performance verification component. And uh, to reiterate, do not allow the use of the equipment for patient sample testing and reporting before it is completely installed, performance is verified, and testing personnel are adequately trained. At this point, we, I need to say one line about change, changes of the equipment. You have installed the equipment, but you have sort of, you want to move it from one room to the other or maybe move it from one place in the room to another place, at such places also you need requalification. This requalification is also carried out after any major repair or modification or software upgradation or because of aging, maybe like in once in a year, just to ensure the fitness of purpose. This performance qualification part becomes part of your change qualification also. Every time you do a change, you need to manage the change by using doing the performance qualification once again. So in um, most of the laboratories, the performance qualifications are done for precision, accuracy, linearity. These are the three components which are done. Also, biological reference ranges are also important to redo after any kind of, even after the installation, because your population may be, I'm just talking about biological reference ranges right now, because your population may have a different biological reference range. So that again requires to be verified due, through performance qualification once your equipment or your measuring system is installed. And the others like uh, limit of detection and specificity of or interference are generally, you take the manufacturer's claims, though it also, the are guidelines to do that. And uh, sample carryover also is something that you need to verify, especially when you are talking about cell counters. So there are tools for this carryover also in that the software that I'm talking about. So now that we have discussed about the process for equipment management pre and post purchase, recapping pre-purchase thoughts, post-purchase activities, and we have understood up until this point when you, it is going to be introduced into service. We have to understand a couple of concepts more 
One is equipment labeling and identification. Each item of equipment is uniquely labeled, marked and identified as shown in the sample label here. Model number and serial number are generally located at the back of the equipment. All what you need to do is to write it up on the front. The reason why this is important is when there is a breakdown or any other reason for which you have to communicate with the manufacturer, the first question they will ask you is which model is it? Depending upon the model, they will be able to provide remote support through the telephone or to help you troubleshoot. Such mechanisms greatly reduce the downtime. Another question they will ask for is the serial number. It is a serial number that will help the manufacturer to identify and track your equipment with regard to warranty, the availability of maintenance contracts like AMC or CMC before they extend their support. Making This is why you need to write down the model number and serial number on the label which is on the front of the equipment. And marking the preventive maintenance and calibration status is also an important aspect that will alert you to the upcoming schedules. This may be put as a separate label as well as this needs to be changed frequently. Another piece of information that I've already talked about which is to be displayed on the equipment on all equipment are your authorizations for use. I just said in the last five minutes, please go back to that and understand why equipment authorization is required. And before we move on to the next concept in equipment management, we need to talk about the documentation for new equipment. We're not talking about general documentation. I'm just talking about documentation that should be in place before we actually start working on it. We've already talked about uh, a few of the documents for purchase and pre-purchase and installation documents, operational documents, all the PQ documents. Now, by this time, you have already accumulated a few pages of work, like maybe like 50, 60 pages of work through all these things. And, and additional to that, you also need to develop your SOPs. SOPs should give use and maintenance of the equipment, how each test is done. Everything should be in place before the equipment starts functioning. At least by the time that it is put into general use, SOP should be ready. And in addition to SOPs, you may need to develop work desk instructions to enable your frontline staff to have easy access for troubleshooting. I'm showing troubleshooting a page from a WHO manual. So similar, this is downloadable. Similar work desk was troubleshooting tables can be put up as uh, work disk instructions also about the QC rules and your flags. All these things should become your work disk instructions for an equipment for the easy understanding of your technical staff. And then additionally develop formats also to capture the data to be evidenced for from the equipment regarding each of the activity that is uh, used for, for the functioning of the equipment. These formats should also be developed upfront and given to your technicians. Develop also a system for recording the use of parts and spare parts and supplies. And in short, to reiterate, create an equipment inventory log which will include all information about the instrument type, model, location in the lab, date of purchase, manufacturer, service engineers, contact details, warranty period, spare parts. All these should be documented. Additionally, your URS that you have used, your DQ, IQ, OQ, PQ, Entire documentation, your SOPs plus your workbench aids plus your formats, all these documents together should tell the story of the equipment in your lab. And develop detailed maintenance schedules including daily, weekly, monthly, annual as required maintenance. This is all part of your formatting. And this everything together should be available for each equipment as long as the equipment is in service and that while you're taking it out of service, even your condemnation record should be there in your laboratory. And once all aspect of the installation process, IQ, OQ, PQ, and training is completed, the machine can now be put to use to report patient samples.